taste and see this kingdom that's coming. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen. All right, you may be seated. So if you're brand new this morning or you missed last week's sermon, I'm not going to do a lot of review, but I would encourage you to maybe check out our YouTube channel and, and go back and listen to that because we're, we're building each week, just like we're always doing, building verse by verse, chapter by chapter. But last week especially began this view of the end times and um, missing one message might give you more questions than answers. So. so we're right in the middle of Paul's defense of a future resurrection of the dead. And he's connecting our future resurrection to the past resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, last week, we took this strange detour. We found ourselves talking about eschatology, the study of end times. We found ourselves talking about um, the kingdom that Christ would hand over to his father. And so therefore you might be asking, and this is a wonderful question, what in the world does Jesus' resurrection have to do with eschatology? What does it have to do with the kingdom? How did Paul make the leap from resurrection to kingdom, from resurrection to eschatology? So glad you asked. When Jesus rose from the dead, we entered into an unprecedented age of the history of humanity. Everything changed. Fundamentally, everything changed. When Jesus took the throne after his resurrection of David at the right hand of God, Psalm 110 began to be fulfilled. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. As one commentator puts it here, sitting at the right hand of God is a description taken from the judicial custom of the East and meant not only the highest honor thinkable, but also unlimited participation in the world dominion of God. This heavenly act of solemn transfer introduces a new era in world history, the era of the kingdom of Christ over the whole world, end quote. That's the connection between resurrection and kingdom. When Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, the Father gave Jesus, who came to fulfill the role of the second Adam, the mediator, he gave Jesus dominion and authority over the whole world. The Puritans understood that this kingdom that Jesus the mediator inherited would actually transform the whole world would transform world history. Uh, it's, it's why Ian Murray called it the Puritan hope. They believed that King Jesus would cause his kingdom to spread over the whole earth before the second coming. That just as that stone in Daniel 2 turned into a great mountain and it encompassed every other realm, that was a prophecy of Christ. I mean, they, they believe that a majority of humanity would be converted, that the nations would learn war no more, that the earth would be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And when that happens, as one author says, generation after generation would love and serve the Lord faithfully, and then the end would come. Now, perhaps you think that that sounds too good, too fantastical, too outrageous to possibly be true. So let's make a deal this morning. If you were to pick up um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and you were to read that to your children, and every other page they started interrupting you, and they said things like, wait a second, there's no such thing as 
magical wardrobes. There's no such thing as talking lions. There's no such thing as a land called Narnia. Well, you would have to explain to them at that that point that C.S. Lewis is asking his readers to willingly suspend their unbelief while they explore Narnia together. Only then will the story come alive. Only then will they see something truly beautiful and breathtaking. Perhaps as I talk about the future kingdom of Christ in history, you're hearing me describe this magical land that doesn't really exist. Okay, fine. But will you willingly suspend your unbelief for just a few moments? May I suggest that you put your mental boxing gloves down and just just listen. Let yourself be brought into this vision of the future history of the world. Listen to how lovely it sounds. Resist the temptation to say, yeah, right, after every other sentence. Take in the whole story. And then after you have heard that all that I have to say, then take that and then test that against the scripture. Can we make that deal? Okay, excellent. Now, since we're going to compare scripture with scripture, uh, we're going to spend most of our time in the Psalms this morning. Uh, why the Psalms? Because the Psalms describe this kingdom that, Jesus, that Paul is talking about. No scripture is an island to itself. The New Testament is an exposition of the old. So here is our big idea this morning. The Psalms tell a story of a great future kingdom where the ends of the earth shall turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship him. So let's begin with our doctrine this morning. Let's look together at verses 24 and 25 of our passage again. Paul says, Then comes the end, that's the second coming, when he, Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all things under his feet. Now recall from last week that we... We talked about three different kingdoms, God's providential kingdom. We called it his ultimate kingdom last week. God's providential kingdom is the triune God's everlasting kingdom in which he exercises total control, power, and sovereignty over all things. Okay, that's not the kingdom that Paul has in mind here. Jesus is not giving that kingdom to the Father. The Father already has that kingdom. Jesus already has that kingdom. The second kingdom is the heavenly or the consummate kingdom. The heavenly kingdom is the eternal state in which God ushers in the new heavens and the new earth and all evil is punished and all the saints are made perfect to the enjoyment of God forever. That's not the kingdom that Paul has in mind here. That kingdom begins after the second coming, at the end of time. It's the third kingdom Paul has in view, the messianic kingdom. The messianic kingdom is the kingdom given to Jesus, the Messiah, at his resurrection, in which he exercises dominion over the world between his first and second coming. So this is the kingdom in which Jesus, acting as the Messiah, exercises his dominion and authority over the world between his first and second coming. That's the kingdom that Paul has in view here. This is the kingdom that he will give back to the Father at the conclusion of this age. So here's the vital question this morning. What will this kingdom look like? I mean, isn't that a legitimate question to ask the passage? Okay, you're giving a kingdom back to the Father. What's the nature of this kingdom? What effect will Christ's defeating his enemies have on this kingdom? 
Again, we are expositing these verses, but this, these verses don't exist by themselves. The entirety of Scripture was informing Paul's mind as he was writing down these words. This, this kingdom idea didn't begin in 1 Corinthians 15. It began in the Old Testament. So, so here are, are kind of two options. Will this kingdom, this present kingdom that we are in, wax from bad to worse to worse as we near the end, or... Are there glorious days ahead for the future of the world? So we arrive at our doctrine this morning. The Psalms tell a story of a great future kingdom where the ends of the earth shall turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship him. Please turn with me to the book of Psalms and we'll look at the easy ones first. Remember, we're asking the question, what does the scripture say that Christ's kingdom will achieve on earth in history? Let's begin in Psalm chapter 2. Now, we looked at this psalm briefly last week. So let's take the overview approach and we'll focus on the last few verses. In verses 1 through 2, The psalmist is pointing out that the nations have rebelled against God and his anointed one. In verses 4 and 5, we read that God is laughing at their rebellion. Why is he laughing at their rebellion? Because God has set up a king on earth. Verse 6, as for me, I have set up my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now notice that this king was crowned in history, not at some future time. He's speaking of the messianic kingdom here. How do we know that? Well, because this king was crowned at his resurrection. Verse 7, I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's the resurrection. How do we know? Because Paul takes that verse in Acts chapter 13, verse 33, and says, Jesus rose from the dead, thus fulfilling Psalm 2. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. That's when he was crowned king. And because Christ is now the king, in verse 6, the Father has given him the title deed to planet Earth. Verse 8, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth, your possession. Now, this is why Jesus said in the Great Commission, the greatness of the Great Commission is his first statement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. King Jesus will exercise this authority in two ways. He will exercise this authority In grace, look at the end of verse 12. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And he will exercise this authority by force. Verse 9, you will break them with a rod of iron, etc. And this rod of iron is God's word. Isaiah 11.4 and Revelation 19.5 uses that same language to describe His word, which brings us to the conclusion of the psalm, verses 10 and 12. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Notice he's warning nations. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, pay homage to him, worship him, trust in him lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. Let's stop right there. Perish in the way, meaning perish during the course of history, in the way. Uh, Not merely at the final judgment, that'll happen. But here it's, if you don't kiss the sun, nations, you're going to perish in history. I think, Many of us um, have this idea that 
Between the first and co- second coming, Jesus is like in a boxing match, but he's in the corner and he's waiting for the bell to ring. And the bell is the second coming. And when the bell rings, then he'll come back in the ring and then he'll, you know, pugilize his opponents. But not until then. It's not what this passage says. He's in the ring right now. The opponents are coming on and he's just boom, knocking one down after the other. Boom. Boom. That's what he's doing. The nations are warned to worship him lest they perish in the way during history before the end. So in this age between the first and second coming, Jesus is conquering his enemies by grace or by force. Let's turn next to Psalm chapter 8. And we're just going to look at one verse here. We sang this this morning. Verse 6, the psalmist says, You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Dominion. Where have we heard that word before? Well, that comes from the cultural mandate, doesn't it? The psalmist here is talking about Adam and all of his posterity that that God in the beginning said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, have dominion over everything. But what happened to Adam? He failed because of sin and he didn't bring the earth under dominion. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul grabs a hold of this verse. This was the verse we ended in, verse 27. For God has put all things in subjection under his Christ's feet. So he applies what the psalmist was applying to Adam and he applies it to Christ. So what he is saying is that when Christ rose from the dead, he became the second Adam who is now. Now he's charged with fulfilling the cultural mandate. Loved ones, is Christ going to fail in the cultural mandate? Adam did. It will, do you think Christ will fare a little bit better than Adam? Christ became the second Adam who is now charged with where the first Adam failed. This is one of the primary responsibilities of Christ. And he will not fail to bring exercise. He will not fail to bring dominion over the entire earth in history to the glory of God. Let's turn next to Psalm 110. Now, this is the other psalm that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Here, the the psalmist says, look in verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The first Lord here, it's a little confusing. I remember reading this as a little kid. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? The Lord said to my Lord. First Lord is the Father. The second Lord is the Son, Jesus Christ, after he ascended into heaven. This is not some conversation in eternity past. This is the conversation at his ascension. And the key word is, here, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, is the word until. Until. Sit at my right hand, until your enemies become your footstool. Now, think of how this word is used elsewhere in Scripture. In Matthew 2, 15, we read that Joseph and Mary and the, the child Jesus remained in Egypt until the death of Herod. Only when Herod died did they return to Israel. So likewise here, what the psalmist is saying is that Jesus must reign until all of his enemies are under his feet. Only when every enemy is defeated will Jesus leave the right hand of God and gloriously return to earth. So here's the question. What enemies are in view here. What enemies are being defeated? 
And as per usual, we have to say, well, what enemies are not being defeated, right? First of all, not all sin is going to be defeated in this kingdom that I'm speaking of. We will still fight against sin until Christ returns. That's the theology of Romans 7. Secondly, not all demonic activity will be defeated. Um, Though the ruler of this world was cast out when Jesus went to the cross, that's John 12, 31, he still prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour until his second coming, 1 Peter 5 eight. The third enemy that's not yet defeated is not every unbeliever will be defeated. We were talking about this in the Sunday school class, that the world is a field and it's full of wheat and tares. There will be tares which represent unbelievers all the way till the end. But guess what that field looks like in the end? Is it a tear field or is it a wheat field? It's a wheat field. Good job. And then finally, the last enemy that will not be destroyed until the second coming is death itself. Paul says that death is the last enemy that's destroyed. So those enemies are are not all the way put under Christ's feet before the second coming. However, we ask the question then, well, then what enemies are? What enemies are left? I mean, he just named all the big ones. Well, we already read about these enemies in Psalm chapter 2. All those wicked kings and wicked nations that oppose him. Those are the enemies that he's defeating. The promise here is that he will defeat every wicked nation that stands against him. As one author puts it, his rule shall be not merely over individuals, but over entire nations. His rule will not merely be personal, but societal. Beloved, can you see how lovely the world would be if if merely that took place? What if the whole world was like this local church? The whole world. This, This little kingdom spread over all the world. Is this little church still attacked by sin? Yes. Do we still uh, suffer oppression by the devil sometimes? Yes. Are there still unbelievers in our midst? Yes. Do we still die? Yes. But what's left? This is the most glorious institution on the planet. In the church alone, in the church alone, we have peace with God and peace with God each other. In the church alone, we have learned by the Holy Spirit of God to have supernatural love towards one another, supernatural forgiveness towards one another, supernatural mercy towards one another. Imagine if that was spread over the globe. Imagine if God were to conquer every enemy in his nations and make the nations his church. Imagine, as Revelation eleven fifteen says, that the kingdom of the world would become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Imagine if the stone that the builders rejected became that mountain that filled the whole world and all the nations streamed to it and they said to one another, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Isaiah 2, 3. Is there evidence that that is the case? Is there evidence that the nations will turn to Christ before his second coming? Yes. Psalm 22. Let's go there next. Psalm 22. Now, Psalm 22 is perhaps the most explicit description of, of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ next to Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament. It begins with those dark words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Look at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this psalm is split perfectly in half. 
in verses 1 through 21, it speaks of Jesus' cross. In verses 22 through 31, it speaks of Jesus' crown. Psalm 22 gives us a whole theology of Christ suffering and reigning in this age. So going through it quickly, in verse 7, we see Christ was mocked. In verse 8, he was reviled. In verses 12 and 13, he was surrounded by his enemies. In verses 14 through 17, he was crucified. But then... Starting in verse 22, Jesus receives the reward of his suffering. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Mark in your Bible right there, Hebrews 2, 12. uh, the, The author of Hebrews quotes this verse pointing to Christ's current exaltation. In other words, Hebrews is cluing us in that verse 22 and following is happening now, right now. So the question is, is what is promised in these final verses? What's promised is that the nations will be converted. Look with me at verses 27 and 28. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And that's too good to be true. Uh, But I want you to notice that he, the focus here is not on individual salvation, as glorious as that is. The focus here is on corporate salvation, on groups, on nations. He uses the language, the ends of the earth. He uses the language, the families of the nations. So as I understand it, there's only three possibilities of what these, verses are, what these two verses mean. The first possibility is that this is speaking about eternity, about heaven. Um, We all agree that no doubt that the the ends of the earth will worship before Christ then. So is this eternity that he's speaking of? Well, that doesn't work. Why doesn't that work? Look at verse 29. People are still dying. Verse 30 and 31 People are still being born. There's no death and and birth and eternity. This this can't be speaking about eternity. The second possibility of what these verses mean is that the psalmist could, could merely be saying that, well, Christians are found in every nation. Christianity is represented by every Nation. I mean, we we say that all the time, right? That Jesus saves individuals from every tribe and tongue and language. Is that what the psalmist is saying here? That this is just talking about representative salvation? Well, I would say that that doesn't seem to work. Mainly from what we're going to see next week. because Because the prophets, beginning in Isaiah, they speak of a time when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's Isaiah chapter two, verse four. The prophets speak of a time when the nations shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, Isaiah 11, nine. Now, how could those things happen? No more war. No more hurting, no more destroying. How could these things happen in the the world unless the world was Christianized? I don't mean that every individual becomes a Christian. There's still tares in the wheat field. But rather the nations as a whole worshipped and loved King Jesus. So those are the first two possibilities. The third possibility is that this means exactly what I've been suggesting. (laughs) That when God promised Abraham 
that he and his offspring would inherit the whole world. Romans 4, 13. Paul says that the promise given to Abraham was that he would inherit the whole world. That that would actually come to pass. You see, this future vision doesn't begin in the book of Psalms. It actually begins with the covenant promises that God had made to Abraham. What was the promise that God made to Abraham? Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I think that we underread that verse. Let's turn finally to Psalm chapter 72. And let's begin in verse 8. May he have dominion from sea to sea. And from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish And of the coastlands, render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. The psalm here is ultimately speaking about the reign of Christ. Originally, it was written for Solomon. That's in the subscript. But the church throughout the ages has recognized that this ultimately refers to Jesus, the messianic king. That's why we sing it in the Psalter. We're going to, I think we're going to sing that today, right? So this is speaking ultimately about Christ. Christ is the one in verse 8 who will have dominion from sea to sea. He, He is the one in verse 11 that says, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Now again, someone could say, well, Psalm 72 isn't talking about this age. It's talking about the eternal state, heaven. But again, I would point to evidence in the text uh, proving the contrary. Verse 2 speaks of suffering. Verse 4 speaks of opposition. Verse 14 speaks of death. Those things don't belong in the eternal state. But they are not inconsistent with the global triumph of the gospel. The future of the world is not a time when all suffering and opposition and death is completely vanquished. That has to wait for Christ's return. But the future of the world is a time, verse 11, when all nations shall serve him. Psalm 72 envisions a time When God will bless the whole earth with abundant food production. Look at verse 16. That's one of the promised blessings of those nations that follow him is increased food production. I will bless your bread basket. It envisions a time when the population of the world increases. Verse 16. Because under Jesus' peaceful reign, wars have ceased to the end of the earth. Psalm 46, 9. The future of the world is a time, in other words, when Christ fulfills this cultural mandate, when he exercises his dominion, he subdues the nations, he multiplies his people all over the face of the earth for the glory of God. Verse 17, may people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. So in summary, we we see how Each of these psalms tell a story about Christ when he rose from the dead and took over the world. Psalm 2 showed us that Christ was crowned king over the nations and that every nation that doesn't follow him will perish in history. Psalm 8, 6 um, shows us that Christ is the second Adam and he will bring the earth under his dominion. Psalm 110 shows us that Jesus will not return until he puts all enemies under his feet. Psalm 22 shows us that the nations will be converted to him. 
Psalm 72 shows us that King Jesus will have dominion from sea to sea and all nations shall call him blessed. The Psalms tell us a story of how the world is transformed under King Jesus before he returns. Let's turn now to our duty. And our duty this morning is simply to consider why eschatology, the study of last things, is an important doctrine to study. Because someone could say, well, if, if eschatology is a secondary doctrine, then why should we even preach on it? And I want to give you three answers. So consider these answers. Why should we preach on eschatology? Answer number one, because the Bible talks about it. We don't get to pick and choose what we want to teach on. We don't lucky dip. We don't say, and stop. We, we are charged with preaching the whole counsel of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Answer number two, why should we preach on eschatology? Answer number two, because it's not mainly about chronology, but about Christology. Eschatology is not mainly about chronology, it's about Christology. It's about the doctrine of Christ. God didn't give us eschatology so that we could work out all the little details about the future. So, so uh, we could, you know, have our um, eschatological charts. We could practice pinning the tail on the Antichrist. We could guess when Jesus is going to return and write books, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is going to Return in 1988. It's not why he gave us the doctrine of eschatology. He gave us eschatology so that we could know Christ better. What did we just read in the Psalms about? We read about Christ we read about his authority and rule over the nations. We read about his mercy and grace in converting the nations. We read about his fellowship and love in being worshipped by the nations. All these psalms are about Christ. Eschatology is not about flow charts. I like flow charts, but eschatology is about the advance of Christ. Answer number three. Why should we preach on eschatology? Because it trains us for righteousness. Because it trains us for righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So we could put that in a syllogism. Premise number one. All doctrine is profitable for training in righteousness. Premise number two, eschatology is a doctrine. Conclusion, therefore, eschatology trains us for righteousness. How does eschatology train us for righteousness? How? Because it produces Why has God given us all these glorious visions in the Psalms of the future of this world? Because he wants to produce hope in us. Hope is what purifies the soul. 1 John 3.3, 3, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. The great 18th century Baptist missionary Andrew Fuller said this about hope, quote, hope is one of the principal springs that keeps mankind in motion. It is vigorous, bold, and enterprising. It causes men to encounter dangers, endure hardships, and surmount difficulties in order to accomplish the desired end, end quote. Loved ones, hope is the jet fuel 
that sets ablaze missions and church planting and enduring hardships for the kingdom of Christ. When we see this gospel victory theme has been heard in the Psalms, it gives us a greater hope. It gives us more hope. Okay, you have some hope? Here, let's pile up the hope more. Let's make a whole mountain of hope so the avalanche of hope is falling down upon you. I can't stand it, God. Too much hope. That transforms the world. And someone might say at this point, wait a second. Shouldn't our hope be set solely only on the second coming of Christ. Uh, second, uh, Titus 2.13 says that's our blessed hope, the, the coming of Christ. Aren't we misplacing hope here? In fact, Ian Murray picks up on this. He said that one of the most common objections against this vision of the kingdom is that it misdirects the true hope of the church away from the second coming of Christ. What do we do with that objection? Well, let me just say this, that no Puritan that I have read who held these views had a misdirected hope. Yes, they hoped in the golden age, but it never surpassed their hope of being with Christ in eternity. The Puritan Thomas Hall, as he lay dying in 1665, said these words, and he believed in this vision. He said, I am now going where I shall have rest from sin and Satan, from all fear, weariness, and watching, and from all the evils and errors of a wicked world. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, for I long of thy coming. The, the present age, no matter how much it transforms, will never be the Christian's final rest. The real problem with this objection is that the objection that says, well, if you hope in this, it's a misdirected hope. It moves hope away from the second coming. The real problem with this objection is that it essentially says that it's only proper to have one hope. If you hold on to the hope of this glorious kingdom, then you can't properly be hoping in the second coming. Well, that's not true. Uh, Romans 4.18 Abraham was commended by God for having hope in becoming the father of many nations. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. Abraham had more than one hope. In 1 Corinthians 9.10, it says that ministers should have hope in their physical needs being provided for as they preach the gospel. I hope that you continue to take care of me after this series is done. We'll see. The plowman should plow in hope and the thresher should thresh in hope in sharing in the crop. In 2 Corinthians 10, 15, Paul hoped that the Corinthians would grow in their faith. But our hope is that your faith increases. So it is not wrong to have subordinate hopes to the second coming. In fact, it's the subordinate hope of this gospel victory theme that spurs us on to love and good works. Do you realize that when Paul went to Corinth, the very book that we're studying, to preach the gospel, he was entirely opposed and reviled by the Jews. He was utterly dejected and rejected. How did God encourage his heart? By putting the jet fuel of hope in it. He said this, Acts 18, 9 through 10, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and I have many in this city who are my people. He's saying, I'm going to give you success. They're not believers yet, but they will be believers. When you preach, you will have success. That's the hope that he gave him. And this hope trained Paul for righteousness. The subordinate hope of a transformed earth is in no way in conflict with the blessed hope of the second coming. So consider carefully, consider carefully those three reasons why we ought to study eschatology. Number one, because the Bible talks about it. We ought to study the whole counsel of God. Number two, because eschatology is not mainly about chronology, but about Christology. 
In studying the future of the world, we're looking into the glories of Jesus. And then number three, because eschatology trains us for righteousness by giving us more and more hope about what King Jesus will accomplish in this age. So let's look finally then at our delight. So we've been through the magical wardrobe. And you've seen Talking Lions. And you've been to Narnia. Hopefully you've at least been able to suspend your unbelief up to this point. So now let's reason together. First, I have given you lots of scriptures defending this glorious vision of the future. But there are lots more to come. Please, please be a good Berean. Don't take my word for these things. And don't take your word. Don't take the thoughts in your head as your word that these things couldn't be true. We are are supposed to test everything against the scripture. We should never formulate our eschatology from our favorite preachers. We should never formulate our eschatology by what we see in the world. Oh, it's so dark. We should never form our eschatology, especially from fictional books like the Left Behind series. Uh, We should never form our eschatology because, oh, this is the majority position today, so I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. We should never form our eschatology simply because, well, this is what I've been raised with. We must formulate our view of the end by what the Scripture says. As Ken Gentry says here, quote, if the Bible teaches that something is true, and something to be expected, then no matter how difficult it is for us to imagine, no matter how strongly arrayed against it are the historical forces of Satan, we must bow to the authority of Scripture. We must believe that with God, all things are possible. You see, it's not a matter of what is probable. It's not a matter of what our eyes can see. We do not walk by, faith, by, by sight. We walk by faith. Secondly, if you are a Christian this morning, then you have all the evidence that you need that this kingdom is possible. Someone might say, Pastor Josh, this can't be true. The world is too evil. It's too dark. It's too wicked. And even some reform folk have objected to this vision of the kingdom. And they say, you guys who hold this, you are not taking total depravity seriously. The world is too depraved, it's too devilish for this kingdom to be established before the second coming. Loved ones, I actually think that might be the worst objection against post-millennialism. Which is more powerful? The fall of Adam or the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Beloved, I want these words to sting deeply. Before Christ saved you, you were as rotten as hell. There was no good thing in you, Romans 3. You were all together worthless. You were altogether ungodly. Your heart loved the darkness because your deeds were wicked. You had no fear of God in your eyes. Titus says that you were foolish. You were disobedient. You were led astray. You were enslaved to the flesh. You passed your days in malice and envy. You hated others and you hated one another. You hated God. 
Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. Before Jesus saved you, you were seething at the soul with hatred towards him. And Christ saved you. He rescued your dark, hell-bent soul. And made you his own. He coveted it with you. He said, I'll take the payment. I'll be slain for him. I'll be buried for him. I'll be treated like a criminal for him. Yes, I can see he's as rotten as hell. And I'll take that hell on my own soul. That's what Titus says. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly, abundantly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Christ saves wretches like you and me. He saves black holes of sin like you and me. And if the gospel has the power to save wretches like us who were alienated from God, is not God able to do that with others? Can God do that with a billion more? What about six billion more? What if, what if that's actually God's plan for the world? What if we read this verse differently? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. we've been under reading what if we've been under reading the promises of God what if there are mountains of hope and beyond those mountains there's more mountains of hope I said this last week but what if the gospel is better than we ever imagined or thought what if what if Psalm 126 applies to this age listen to what the psalmist says When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. We were like those who dream. Let's pray.